Welcome to session six of our study on the Apocrypha, the first book of Maccabees. In this session, we will finish reading chapter 11 and also read chapters 12 and 13. Jonathan has tried negotiation, military strategy, and outright deception in attempting to move Judea closer to the goal of independence from the Seleucid Empire, but he is not quite there yet. He seems to be making progress. Alexander Ballas and Ptolemy are both dead, but there is a new villain in town, Trypho. There is also the matter of the Seleucid man Citadel smack dab in the middle of Jerusalem. What's a high priest to do? We will see in a minute, but first, a prayer. O oh God, our Father, open our eyes and enlighten our minds as we study your word. So grant that our minds may know your truth, and our hearts may feel your love, and then confirm and strengthen our wills that we may go out to live what we have learned through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, 1 Maccabees is one of the books of the Apocrypha. It was part of the Septuagint, a Greek version of the Hebrew Bible that was not accepted as scriptural by the Hebrews or by most Protestants, but is a part of the Catholic canon. So far in our study, we have learned how early in the 2nd century BCE, the Seleucid Empire took control of a large area near the eastern Mediterranean that included Judah. The Seleucid king Antiochus for Epiphans defiled the temple in Jerusalem, put up altars all over the land, and abolished the observance of the Sabbath and circumcision. A priest by the name of Matthias rebelled against the Seleucid rulers. After his death in 165 BCE, his five sons took up the rebel cause, raised armies, and negotiated with various Seleucid kings and officials. Judas Maccabeus, an early military leader of the rebellion, won some decisive battles, but in 161 his forces were defeated and Judas was killed. Judas's brother Jonathan then took up the reins of leadership and through shrewd political maneuvering was named high priest and advanced the cause of the Judeans against a string of Seleucid kings and pretenders to be kings. Jonathan, however, has still been unable to remove the Seleucid troops from the citadel in Jerusalem overlooking the temple. The current ruler, Demetrius II, was not only facing a revolt from his furloughed, furloughed soldiers at home, but appeared to have another rival on the horizon as we ended our last session. The year is 145 BCE, and we begin with verse 41 of chapter 11. Now Jonathan sent to King Demetrius the request that he remove the troops of the citadel from Jerusalem and the troops in the strongholds, for they kept fighting against Israel. And Demetrius sent this message back to Jonathan. Not only will I do these things for you and your nation, but I will confer great honor on you and on your nation if I find opportunity. Now then, will you do well? Now then, you will do well to send me men who will help me, for all my troops have revolted. So Jonathan sent 3,000 stalwart men to him at Antioch, and when they came to the king, the king rejoiced at their arrival. If Jonathan had been successful in his siege of the citadel, he wouldn't now be asking Demetrius to remove the troops. So it's clear at this point that Jonathan failed in his attempt to capture the citadel in Jerusalem. But it's also clear that the king needs Jonathan's help. He has sent all his native troops home without pay, and they are revolting against him. All he has available are Cretan mercenaries to defend him, and he needs more help. Jonathan sends 3,000 of his troops to help Antioch to help him out. So let's go on to verse 45. Then the people of the city assembled within the city to the number of 120,000, and they wanted to kill the king. But the king fled into the palace. Then the people of the city seized the main streets of the city and began to fight. So the king called the Jews to his aid, and they all rallied around him, and then spread out throughout the city, and they killed on that day about 100,000. They set fire to the city, and seized a large amount of spoil on that day, and saved the king. When the people of the city saw that the Jews had gained control of the city as they pleased, their courage failed, and they cried out to the king with this entreaty, Grant us peace, and make the Jews stop fighting against us in our city. And they threw down their arms and made peace. So the Jews gained glory in the sight of the king and of all people in his kingdom, and they returned to Jerusalem with a large amount of spoil. 
So the account that we have here of the Battle of Antioch features inflated numbers of troops and very likely exaggerates the role of Jonathan's army in winning the battle. The bulk of the fighting was probably done by the Cretan mercenaries. Nevertheless, the presence of the Jewish soldiers may well have saved Demetrius' life. The result was that the Jewish forces won glory in the battles and took home much plunder or spoil. We read verses 52 through 59. So King Demetrius sat on the throne of his kingdom, and the land was quiet before him. But he broke his word about all that he had promised. He became estranged from Jonathan and did not repay the favors that Jonathan had done him, but treated him very harshly. After this, Typho returned, and with him the young boy Antichus, who began to reign and put on the crown. All the troops that Demetrius had discharged gathered around him, and they fought against Demetrius, and he fled and was routed. Trypho captured the elephants and gained control of Antioch. Then the young Antichus wrote to Jonathan, saying, I confirm you in the high priesthood, and set you over the four districts, and make you one of the king's friends. He also sent him gold plates and a table service, and granted him the right to drink from gold cups, and dress in purple, and wear a gold buckle. He appointed Jonathan's brother Simon, governor, from the ladder of Tyre to the borders of Egypt. So we see here that the battle of Antioch was over. Demetrius, too, forgot all about the promises he had made to Jonathan. However, Trypho and the young Antichus VI came to town with the support of the disgruntled soldiers and drove Demetrius out of the city. If you remember, Antichus VI was the son of Alexander Ballas, so he had some legitimate claim to the throne. His father had been king, regardless of whether Alexander was actually who he said he was. By capturing the elephants, Trypho gained the military advantage and captured Antioch. Ever the shrewd politician, Jonathan went over to the new regime. The appointment of Simon as governor of the coastal region from the southern border of Lebanon to the northern border of Egypt expanded Maccabean control of the land of Israel much farther to the west. We go on with verse 60. Then Jonathan set out and traveled beyond the river and among the towns, and all the army of Syria gathered to him as allies. When he came to Ascalon, the people of the city met him and paid him honor. From there he went to Gaza, but the people of Gaza shut him out. So he besieged it and burned its suburbs with fire and plundered them. Then the people of Gaza pleaded with Jonathan, and he made peace with them, and he took the sons of the rulers as hostages and sent them to Jerusalem, and he passed through the country as far as Damascus. So Jonathan was apparently traveling around the area in order to recruit soldiers to fight against Demetrius too. In verse 60, it says he traveled beyond the river. This means he toured the province west of the Euphrates. If you recall, Bacchides had been governor of this province when he was first introduced. We go to verse 63. Then Jonathan heard that the officers of Demetrius had come to Kadesh in Galilee with a large army, intending to remove him from office. He went to meet them, but left his brother Simon in the country. Simon encamped before Beth Zur and fought against it for many days and hemmed it in. Then they asked him to grant them terms of peace, and he did so. He removed them from there, took possession of the town, and set a garrison over it. Since Jonathan was now openly supporting Antichus VI, the generals of Demetrius II wanted to stop him from recruiting troops. Kadesh in Galilee was used as an administrative center by the Seleucids, so while Jonathan approaches Kadesh, his brother Simon had been fighting against the fortress at Beth Zur in the south. Verse 67 through the end of the chapter. Jonathan and his army encamped by the waters of Gennesaret. Early in the morning they marched to the plain of Hazor. There in the plain the army of the foreigners met him. They had set an ambush against him in the mountains, but they themselves met him face to face. Then the men in ambush emerged from the places and joined their places and joined battle. All the men with Jonathan fled. Not one of them was left except Matthias, son of Absalom, and Judas, son of Caliphi, commanders of the forces of the army. Jonathan tore his clothes, put dust on his head, and prayed. Then he turned back to the battle against the enemy and routed them, and they fled. 
When his men who were fleeing saw this, they returned to him and joined him in the pursuit as far as Kadesh, to their camp, and there they encamped. As many as 3,000 of the foreigners fell that day, and Jonathan returned to Jerusalem. So Hazor was a plain about 10 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. The enemy here were probably Cretan mercenaries. At first, the battle went badly for Jonathan, and many of the troops deserted. But following the example of Joshua in Joshua 7, 6 through 9, Jonathan prayed and then returned to battle. Many of the deserters returned and killed thousands of the foreign troops. So here we in chapter 11. In chapter 12, we will read about new alliances with Rome and Sparta. We have seen that the dealing with the unscrupulous trifle can be dangerous. So Jonathan and Simon face new challenges here. We begin chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now when Jonathan saw that the time was favorable for him, he chose men and sent them to Rome to confirm and renew the friendship with them. He also sent letters to the same effect to the Spartans and to other places. So they went to Rome and entered the Senate chamber and said, The high priest Jonathan and the Jewish nation have sent us to renew the former friendship and alliance with them. And the Romans gave them letters to the people in every place, asking them to provide for the envoys safe conduct to the land of Judah. So Rome had just defeated the Greek Achaean League in 146 BC. Antiochus VI had ascended to the throne in 145. Keep in mind that Demetrius II was not dead. He was still around. He was just no longer in the western capital of Antioch. So Jonathan thought this was a favorable time to talk with the Romans again. Both Jonathan and the Romans were in powerful positions at this point. But he also wanted to reach out to the Spartans, potentially another strong ally. The Spartans had not been a member of the Achaean League and not been battling with the Romans. So we read verses 5 through 18. This is a copy of the letter that Jonathan wrote to the Spartans. The high priest Jonathan, the senate of the nation, the priests, and the rest of the Jewish people to their brothers, the Spartans. Greetings. Already in time past, a letter was sent to the high priest Onaes from Arius, who is king among you, stating that you are our brothers, as the appended copy shows. Onias welcomed the envoy with honor and received the letter, which contained a clear declaration of alliance and friendship. Therefore, though we have no need of these things, since we have as encouragement the holy books that are in our hands, we have undertaken to send to renew our family ties and friendship with you, so that we may not become estranged from you, for considerable time has passed since you sent us sent your letter to us. We therefore remember you constantly on every occasion, both at our festivals and on other appropriate days, at the sacrifices that we offer in our prayers, as it is right and proper to remember brothers. And we rejoice in your glory, but as for ourselves, many trials and many wars have encircled us. The kings around us have waged war against us. We were unwilling to annoy you and our other allies and friends with these wars, for we have a help that comes from heaven for our aid. And so we were delivered from our enemies, and our enemies were humbled. We therefore have chosen Numinus, son of Antichus and Antipater, son of Jason, and have sent them to Rome to renew our former friendship and alliances with them. We have commanded them to go also to you and to greet you and to deliver you this letter from us concerning the renewal of our family ties. And now, please send us a reply to this. So Arius, the king of Sparta, had sent a letter to Anias, um, the Jewish high priest around the year 300 BCE. The body of Jonathan's letter gives the impression that Onias I failed to answer Arius' letter. We have been very busy fighting wars and doing other stuff for the past 160 years and just haven't had the time to respond yet. And we really didn't want to bother you. In verse 19 through 23, we have a copy of the original letter from Anias. This is a copy of the letter that they sent to Onias. King Arius of the Spartans, to the high priest Onias, greetings. 
It has been found in writing concerning the Spartans and the Jews that they are brothers and are of the family of Abraham. And now that we have learned this, please write us concerning your welfare. We, on our part, write to you that your livestock and your property belong to us, and ours belong to you. We therefore command that our envoys report to you accordingly. So we go on with verses 24 through 32. Now Jonathan heard that the commanders of Demetrius had returned with a larger force than before to wage war against him. So he marched away from Jerusalem and met them in the region of Hamath, for he gave them no opportunity to invade his own country. He sent spies to their camp, and they returned and reported to him that the enemy were being drawn up in formation to attack the Jews by night. So when the sun had set, Jonathan commanded his troops to be alert and to keep their arms at hand so as to be ready all night for battle. And he stationed outposts around the camp. When the enemy heard that Jonathan and his troops were prepared for battle, they were afraid and were terrified at heart. So they kindled fires in their camp and withdrew. But Jonathan and his troops did not know it until morning, for they saw the fires burning. Then Jonathan pursued them, but he did not overtake them, for they had crossed the Eleutherus River. So Jonathan turned aside against the Arabs, who were called Zabadeans, and he crushed them and plundered them. Then he broke camp and went to Damascus and marched through all that region. So Jonathan finds that Demetrius' generals are coming to attack him. So he proactively plans to attack them. They find out about Jonathan's plans and withdraw at night. Demetrius' army apparently retreats so quickly that Jonathan and his army can't catch them. Frustrated, Jonathan attacks and plunders the Zebedeans about 30 miles northwest of Damascus. Verses 33 through 38. Simon also went out and marched through the country as far as Ascalon and the neighboring strongholds. He turned aside to Joppa and took it by surprise, for he had heard that they were ready to hand over the stronghold to those whom Demetrius had sent, and he stationed a garrison there to guard it. When Jonathan returned, he convened the elders of the people and planned with them to build strongholds in Judea to build the walls of Jerusalem still higher and to erect a high barrier between the citadel and the city to separate it from the city in order to isolate it so that the garrison could neither buy nor sell. So they gathered together to rebuild the city. Part of the wall on the valley to the east had fallen, and he repaired the section called Chephentha. Simon also built Adida in the Shephala. He fortified it, installed gates with bolts. Simon, who was now governor of the coastal region, put down a planned rebellion among the supporters of Demetrius II at Joppa, which was part of his territory. It was right on the coast. When Jonathan arrived back at Jerusalem, he worked out a plan for a series of strongholds in Judea under his control. Since his efforts at taking control of the citadel had failed, he devised a scheme to wall it off and isolate it from the city, so that the citadel was basically trapped. We read 39 through 45. Then Trypho attempted to become king in Asia and put on the crown and to raise his hand against King Antichus. He feared that Jonathan might not permit him to do so, but might make war on him. So he kept seeking to seize and kill him, and he marched out and came to Beth Sham. Jonathan went out to meet him with 40,000 picked warriors, and he came to Beth Shem. When Trypho saw that he had come with a large army, he was afraid to raise his hand against him. So he received him with honor and commended him to all his friends, and he gave him gifts and commanded his friends and his troops to obey him as they would himself. Then he said to Jonathan, Why have you put all these people to, do to so much trouble when we are not at war? Dismiss them now to their homes and choose for yourself a few men to stay with you and come with me to Ptolemaeus. I will hand it over to you as well as the other strongholds and the remaining troops and all the officials, and will turn around and go home, for that is why I am here. Trypho is the nickname for Diod Otos. It means self-indulgent. He was a former officer of Demetrius I and later of Alexander, 
Trypho's plan was to make himself king of Asia, which was another name for the Seleucid kingdom. Only fear of Jonathan prevented him from doing so. Part of his plan was to seize and kill Jonathan at a meeting at Bethshan. When Jonathan showed up with 40,000 troops, although that's probably a large exaggeration, he needed another plan. He then invited Jonathan to accompany him with a few troops to Ptolemaeus. So what should Jonathan do? We read 46 through 48. Jonathan trusted him and did as he said. He sent away the troops, and they returned to the land of Judah. He kept with him 3,000 men, 2,000 of whom he left in Galilee, while 1,000 accompanied him. But when Jonathan entered Ptolemaeus, the people of Ptolemaeus closed the gates and seized him, and they killed with the sword all who had entered with him. They killed all the troops who Jonathan had brought with him to Ptolemaeus, but we did not read what they did to Jonathan. It doesn't look good. We go on to verse 49 through the end of the chapter. Then Trypho sent troops and cavalry into Galilee in the Great Plain to destroy all Jonathan's soldiers. But they realized that Jonathan had been seized and had perished along with his men. And they encouraged one another and kept marching in close formation, ready for battle. When their pursuers saw that they would fight for their lives, they turned back. So they all reached the land of Judah safely, and they mourned for Jonathan and his companions, and were in great fear, and all Israel mourned deeply. All the nations around them tried to destroy them, for they said, They have no leader or helper. Now therefore let us make war on them, and blot out the memory of them from humankind. Jonathan appears to be gone. Judah has no leader. Now it seems a good time to finish them off as we finish chapter 12. Some scholars consider this the end of the second major section of 1 Maccabees. The first section, chapter 3 through 9.22, was the story of Judas Maccabeus. In chapter 13, we pick up the story of Simon, the last of the Maccabean brothers. So whether this is a continuation of the second major section of the book, or if we just look at this as a third major section, either way, we begin chapter 13. We begin with uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 6. Simon heard that Trypho had assembled a large army to invade the land of Judah and destroy it. And he saw that the people were trembling with fear. So he went up to Jerusalem, and gathering the people together, he encouraged them, saying to them, You yourselves know what great things my brothers and I and the house of my father have done for the laws and the sanctuary. You know also the wars and the difficulties that my brothers and I have seen. By reason of this, all my brothers have perished for the sake of Israel, and I alone am left. And now far be it from me to spare my life in any time of distress, for I am not better than my brothers. But I will avenge my nation and the sanctuary and your wives and children, for all the nations have gathered together out of hatred to destroy us. So Simon appears to be the only surviving brother. He speaks to the people in Jerusalem and promises to carry on the work and bring vengeance on Israel's enemies. We go on to verse 7. The spirit of the people was rekindled when they heard these words, and they answered in a loud voice, You are our leader in place of Judas and your brother Jonathan. Fight our battles, and all that you say to us we will do. So he assembled all the warriors and hurried to complete the walls of Jerusalem, and he fortified it on every side. He sent Jonathan, son of Absalom, to Joppa, and with him a considerable army, and he drove out its occupants and remained there. Then Trypho left Ptolemaeus with a large army to invade the land of Judah, and Jonathan was with him under guard. Simon encamped in Adida, facing the plain. Trifle learned that Simon had risen up in place of his brother, Jonathan, and that he was about to join battle with him. So he sent envoys to him and said, It is for the money that your brother Jonathan owed the royal treasury in connection with the offices he held that we are detaining him. Send now 100 talents of silver and two of his sons as hostages, so that when released, he will not revolt against us and we will release him. 
the people responded by acclaiming Simon as their new leader. He raised an army, completed the fortification of Jerusalem, and sent Jonathan, son of Absalom, to Joppa to secure it. Trypho has left Ptolemaeus and headed toward Judah, but he finds himself blocked at Adid, which Simon recently had fortified. He sends a message to Simon claiming that Jonathan owned owed a large sum of money to the royal treasury. He promises that he will release Jonathan if Simon sends the money along with two of Jonathan's sons as hostages. Verses 17 through 24. Simon knew that they were speaking deceitfully to him, but he sent to get the money and the sons so that he would not arouse great hostility among the people who might say it was because Simon did not send him the money that and sons that Jonathan perished. So he sent the sons and the hundred talents, but Trypho broke his word and did not release Jonathan. After this, Trypho came to invade the country and destroy it, and he circled around the way to Adora, but Simon and his army kept marching along opposite him to every place he went. Now the men in the citadel kept sending envoys to Trypho, urging him to come to them by way of the wilderness and to send them food. So Trifo got all his cavalry ready to go, but that night a very heavy snow fell, and he did not go because of the snow. He marched off and went out into the land of Gilead. When he approached Baksama, he killed Jonathan, and he was buried there. Then Trifo turned and went back to his own land. So Simon was in a trap, and he knew it. He knew that if he refused, he might be criticized for failing to do everything possible on Jonathan's behalf or even wanting to take over Jonathan's offices. Having outwitted Simon, Trypho turned to military action in hopes of capturing Jerusalem by force. He first tried to approach from the south, as Lysias had done years before, but he was blocked at every point. The men in the citadel, who were at this point starving, suggested he approach from the Judean desert in the southwest, but a surprise snowstorm made that impossible. He gave up and had Jonathan killed and buried near Baksama, and probably Jonathan's sons, his hostages, were killed at the same time in that winter of 43, 143 to 142. So we read uh, verses 25 through 30. Simon sent and took the bones of his brother Jonathan and buried him in Modian the city of his ancestors. All Israel bewailed him with great lamentation and mourned for him for many days. And Simon built a monument over the tomb of his father and his brothers. He made it high so that it might be seen with polished stone at the front and the back. He also erected seven pyramids opposite one another for his father and mother and four brothers. For the pyramids he devised an elaborate setting, erecting about them great columns and on the columns he put suits of armor for a permanent memorial, and beside the suits of armor he carved ships so that they could be seen by all who sail in the sea. This is the tomb that he built in Modin. It remains to this day. The funeral for Jonathan was turned into a period of national mourning. Simon erected an elaborate monument over the tomb and set up seven pyramids, one each for his mother and father, for his four brothers and one for himself. Modin was 12 miles from the coast, so it's not likely the carvings could be seen from the sea. Thus ended the life of Jonathan. He was a brilliant strategist and a shrewd politician. He skillful dealings with the Seleucid throne rescued the Maccabean revolt from apparent defeat at the death of Judas, and he did much to make the people of Judah and beyond into an independent nation once again. We go on with verses 31 through 42. Trypho dealt treacherously with the young king Antichus. He killed him and became king in his place, putting on the crown of Asia. And he brought great calamity on the land. But Simon built up the strongholds of Judea and walled them all around with high towers and great walls and gates and bolts. And he stored food in the strongholds. Simon also chose emissaries and sent them to King Demetrius with a request to grant relief to the country. For all that Trypho did was to plunder. King Demetrius sent him a favorable reply to his request and wrote him a letter as follows. King Demetrius to Simon, the high priest and friend of kings, and to the elders in the nation of the Jews, greetings. We have received the 
gold crown and the palm branch that you sent, and we are ready to make a general peace with you and to write to our officials to grant you release from tribute. All the grants that we have made to you remain valid, and let the strongholds that you have built be your possessions. We pardon any errors and offenses committed to this day and cancel the crown tax that you owe, and whatever other tax has been collected in Jerusalem shall be collected no longer. And if any of you are qualified to be enrolled in our bodyguard, let them be enrolled, and let there be peace between us. In 142, Trypho deposed Antichus VI and made himself king of the Sucleid Empire. He later had Antichus killed in 139. The murder of Jonathan had made him an enemy of the Maccabees, so Simon prepared for war by strengthening his fortifications again and seeking new allies. Acting on the principle that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, Simon opened up negotiations with Demetrius II, who was still at large, though in exile away from Antioch. Demetrius didn't have the kind of power that he'd had earlier, so his concessions to Simon were not backed by any existing Seleucid government, but Simon took what he could get. So we read verses 41 and 42. In the 170th year, the yoke of the Gentiles was removed from Israel, and the people began to write in their documents and contracts. In the first year of Simon, the great high priest and commander and leader of the Jews. There was a sense of liberation and a new beginning. It was the year 142 BCE. So we read on with verses 43 through 48. In those days, Simon encamped against Gazara and surrounded it with troops. He made a siege engine, brought it up to the city, and battered and captured one tower. The men in the siege engine leaped out into the city, and a great tumult arose in the city. The men in the city with their wives and children went up on the wall with their clothes torn, and they cried out with a loud noise, asking Simon to make peace with them. They said, Do not treat us according to our wicked acts, but according to your mercy. So Simon reached an agreement with them and stopped fighting against them. But he expelled them from the city and cleansed the houses in which the idols were located, and then entered it with hymns and praise. He removed all uncleanliness from it, and settled it, settled in it those who observed the law. He also strengthened its fortifications, and built in it a house for himself. While Trypho and Demetrius too were engaged in their own power struggle, Simon went about strengthening his own position in the region near Judea. We have heard of Gazara before. This is the city we more likely know as Gezer which is northeast of Jerusalem on the western edge of the mountains. He chased the inhabitants out, purified it, and moved in with the Jewish population, probably as soldiers as a reward for their good work. We finish this chapter beginning with verse 49. Those who were in the citadel at Jerusalem were prevented from going in and out to buy and sell in the country, so they were very hungry, and many of them perished from famine. Then they cried to Simon to make peace with them, and he did so. But he expelled them from there and cleansed the citadel from its pollutants. pollutions. On the 23rd day of the second month, in the 171st year, the Jews entered it with praise and palm branches, and with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments, and with hymns and songs, because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. Simon decreed that every year they should celebrate this day with rejoicing. He strengthened the fortifications of the Temple Hill alongside the citadel, and he and his men lived there. Simon saw that his son John had reached manhood, and so he made him commander of all the forces, and he lived at Gazara. In June 141, the citadel surrendered to Simon, and he let the Seleucid soldiers leave in peace. The capture of the citadel by the Simon and his supporters became the occasion for a celebration. It marked the final success in the revolt that had begun some 25 years before. Simon and his companions took up residence in the citadel. So the chapter ends with the introduction of John Harkins, Simon's son, who is made commander of the army. So here we end our sixth session. In session seven, we conclude the first book of Maccabees. We will read and discuss chapters 14, 15, and 16. We will hear about another Antichus 
and the renewal of a Roman alliance. Until then, be safe, and we'll see you Sunday.